Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, privilege, power, party politics, and how do we stop war? All that and a few words from me on the history of how the Irish became white. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and I'm speaking to two very special guests here at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Summit in Baltimore. A lot of the conversation since the inauguration of Donald Trump has been about how progressives can create movements that span different issues and bring people together. If ever there was a moment to come together, progressives and the left say, it was now. I won't say courtesy of Donald Trump, but in the Trump era. If we can't do it now, when can we do it? Our next guests are, are perfect people to speak to it. Rashad Robinson is executive director of Color of Change. Kika Matos directs immigration and racial justice programs for the Center for Community Change. Kika, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Let's hear from you first, the scenario, the scene as, as you see it right now with respect to this question of movements coming together. Is it happening? Is it not happening? It's happening. Um, by necessity, look, you know, we're all under attack. Women are under attack, immigrants, refugees, people of color are under attack. And uh, if it's one thing that I uh, am grateful for um, since the election is the way that all of our movements have converged to strategize together and to figure out how we fight back. So what are you seeing, Rashad? I'm seeing people willing to um, take to the streets that have never shown up. I'm seeing people who are at marches and rallies that don't know what the word organizing means. And I think that that is incredibly important. I think the opportunity that we have, right, from this thing that we're seeing is how do we challenge, channel? How do we channel people's energy to make their participation valuable? How are we pushing people and giving people the right things to do? How are we following the energy? There's this um, story out of the March on Washington that I always love that's told. It's um, in John Lewis's book. And John Lewis talks about that morning of the march when they went to the leaders went to go meet um, President Kennedy. And they were like, you know, held up a bit and they were up there talking and people got rest restless down on the streets and the march left. And so the pictures that you see from that march of Dr. King, and they're actually in the middle of the march, not in the front of the march. And I think what I am seeing is people stepping out, restless, willing to lead on their own from the women's march to so many others, people taking actions in their own hands. And the responsibility for advocates and organizers and institutions is how do we provide the infrastructure to help channel that energy into the type of change that we need. And how are you handling it in the immigrant rights movement, Kika? Presumably people are dealing with urgent, immediate, life-threatening needs as well as this need to resist. So we're doing a couple of things. One is we are get gearing up for state fights at the local level because that's where they're going to happen. And so we are quickly moving to stand up as many sanctuary communities as we can around the country. We're working with state um, government official, uh, state and local government officials to make sure that they have plans in place and they're ready to mount a legal defense and that they're ready to protect their communities. We're working with churches who are willing to offer sanctuary so that when people are fleeing from raids, they have a place to go to and and um, to live uh, uh, and to be protected. We are working with organizers across the country to make sure that we put forward a deportation defense. So when deportations start happening, we put our bodies on the line and we prevent immigration and customs enforcement from taking people away. We are building out our movement, right? Because we are going to need every single person who has a voice in this country who cares about social justice to step out and protect their communities because when raids happen, they don't happen um, in some abstract federal land. They happen in our communities. We are really doing everything we can to build this movement out to say, you have to protect us, you have to fight with us and mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. because if we don't, then they, they are, our democracy it's not just the lives of immigrants. I think our very democracy mm. is at stake. If they can do that to immigrants, imagine what they're going to be willing to do to any dissenting American. But this isn't a brand new moment, although there are new aspects mm -hmm. to it. And it has to be said that the fight for immigration justice, as led by the Dreamers and others, didn't see a lot of African-American participation. The fight for Black Lives Matter was largely a black movement. Mm -hmm. What's going to make it different this time? Is it already different, Rashad? 
Well, I think in certain parts of the country, it's absolutely different. I live in the Northeast. I live in New York, where um, you know I go to a barber shop of black folks who are speaking Spanish, right? Like mm -hmm. the Dominican and Puerto Rican and and um, and um, you know black American communities have been um, living together and connected in many ways. I do think, though, that this is a real opportunity because so much, not just in terms of black and brown, but so much of the connections that we've had um, have been weaved together by leaders and not necessarily always at the institutional level. People being mm. in the same boat in this moment, having to fight the same type of fights collectively, that criminal justice isn't your issue over here and immigration isn't yours, but we've got um, an authoritarian leader that has weaved all these things together and is going to create a hostile climate that we've all got to face back. Now, we've got an opportunity to fight. So, Kika, really interesting thing that Rashad just said, that sometimes our movement leaders connect, but the base doesn't connect. What work needs to be done there, or where does that connection happen? Well, here's the irony. What's happening right now uh, in our communities is that the base is connecting much more than leaders are, <laughs> because in moments of crisis, what happens? People set aside uh, their differences and come together uh, to work uh, in the most strategically effective way possible. And so I'll give you an example. Uh, last, I live in New Haven, Connecticut, which is a sanctuary city. As soon as the executive orders came out, we decided to have a rally and a press conference. Uh, who, was, who was on the podium speaking? Our mayor, who's African-American. Uh, a leader in the African-American church who's really well known, um, the police chief who's Latino, and then in the crowd, and then you had impacted immigrants talking and sharing their stories. In the crowd uh, were folks from Black Lives Matter, were students from Yale University, uh, faith-based leaders who were both in the crowd and also speaking, and it was this incredible uh, uh, outpouring and display of um, what movements can do when they, when they come together. And all of those fights that we had last year about some piddly little thing that we didn't agree with, the, that was gone. I mean, it was, it was the, and the energy in that crowd, people that we had never seen before, and people saying to us afterwards, this is the first rally I've been to um, in, in, in years, right? Students saying, wow. You know, now I'm an activist, right? I've been go, you know, I've I've been to three marches in the last week, and so, and so I do think that that what we need to focus much more on is sustaining that energy. Mm -hmm. We really have to, as as movement leaders, figure out, okay, how do we make sure that at every single level we are leaning in and working together? And how do we, Rashad? Well, I think that we've actually got to give people real things to do, real campaigns that matter. Um, people. Um, well, movements move at the speed of trust, and our ability to be able to move together will be about the campaigns that we work on together. And so I don't think that we can model this out in a vacuum. We're going to have to find collective things that we work together on, um, and then we're going to have to model um, winning together and losing together and defending one another. Um, I also think that. Um, We've also got to find the opportunities at the local level to win real-world victories. Yeah. On the left, oftentimes, we think about winning as winning an argument um, or even winning elections. And when I say winning, I mean that we've actually got to make changes uh, to bail reform and paid sick leave and, and minimum wage and a whole host of issues that will make people's lives measurably better. So when the conversation comes back around two years and four years from now and it says, you know, you may not like us on the left, but while this was happening in the federal level, while Donald Trump was doing everything to make as much money as he could off the government, we were winning real world victories for you at the local level. And that is the type of conversation that moves us beyond rhetoric with people to actually people feeling like there's a stake um, in their participation, like their participation matters. So let me ask you both. You talked about people who are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. coming together, and I'm hearing that it's happening, I'm seeing that it's happening. Mm -hmm. At the same time, white supremacy has always been, white privilege has always been deployed yeah. to tell white people they're in a different boat, yes. and particularly white men. Mm -hmm. This administration is not stupid about how to deploy race or patriarchy. Mm -hmm. How do you inoculate yourselves? How do we inoculate ourselves 
against exactly that, the deployment of white privilege to tell white people they're in a different boat and a boat that's against your boat. I think that um, righteous white people need to step up and fight and acknowledge that being in struggle also means setting aside your own privileges and being willing to share power. And so I'll be brutally honest to say white folks need to step up um, and be humble and be courageous and recognize that in order for us ultimately to win this struggle, we have got to fight uh, for racial justice mm -hmm. in the most fundamental ways. I'm sure. So I would love if that happened. I also think on the left we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. because we have a brand problem on the left mm -hmm. and it's a brand that people don't actually want to get behind. In 2007, would anyone have guessed, or I know I should say I couldn't have guessed, that a man named Barack Hussein Obama would have been elected president? Yes, white supremacy exists. And at the same time, Barack Obama was elected and reelected because there was a brand that, of action that people could get behind even while, um, not, even while all those other things existed. And so I hope from the lessons out of this election, we just don't think that like there's nothing we can do to face down sort of like these intractable problems of, of the ways in which whiteness impacts our ability to move, but that we can do a lot of things on our side to build a type of multiracial, multigender, multi-class movements that bring people in and can move this country forward. I also think that people could come to hate Donald Trump and not choose our side as a result. And we've got to be very careful about how we bring people together because there could be movements of black folks and poor whites that come together to face back against Donald Trump and the attacks on health care, but those movements could actually still be like anti-immigration. Um, there are all sorts of sort of things that could happen, and so we just can't say Donald Trump's going to be bad and we're all going to come mm -hmm. together. We also have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Final thoughts from you, Kika. Uh, I, a home truth about a pitfall that we've fallen into many times and how to avoid it, perhaps? I think that the, this is a moment that calls for people to radically not just step up and act, but to think about ways of doing things differently so that we actually not just defeat this man, but seize back our democracy. Because at the end of the day, I, I think this fight is about protecting and preserving our democracy. Kika Matos, Rashad Robinson, thank you both. Thank great you. to have you in the sort of pseudo studio we have here. Always great to see you in the streets too. Thanks. Thank you for having us. I'm Laura Flanders. I'm sitting with Medea Benjamin, one of the co-founders of Code Pink. No one knows more about resisting business as usual on Capitol Hill than Medea. She has been a voice and a body being dragged out of congressional hearings, Senate halls, and, well, the conventions of both parties, I think, um, than Medea Benjamin does. Medea, welcome back to the program. Glad to have you. Good to be with you, Laura. Talk about this moment. When there's a debate, it seems, still on Capitol Hill about how to respond to the incoming Trump administration and the degree to which it should or shouldn't be normalized. I think the people are way out in front of the elected leaders in the Democratic Party and even a lot of the progressive leaders. Um, it was the people who organized the Women's March. It was people who have organized the disruptions of the inauguration and have had uh, the most amazing uh, airport demonstrations that I've ever seen and that have been doing uh, resistance in these last couple of weeks on a scale that um, I don't, we haven't had in, in uh, recent history. Now, the airport demonstrations that you refer to were the ones against um, President Trump's immigration ban on seven majority Muslim countries. One of the countries missing from that list was Saudi Arabia, a country you know well and conducted an extraordinary teach-in on um, in the fall of 2016. What was your reaction when you saw Saudi Arabia left off that list, just to start? 
Well, I wasn't surprised because I know that every U.S. president for the last 12 presidents, Democrat and Republican, have had this cozy relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, based on oil, the weapons industry, money. I once asked uh, a congressperson why uh, this relationship exists, and he just went like this, and that says it all. Uh, but it's so ironic because uh, when you see that there were zero U.S. Uh, citizens who were killed by any member uh, from the seven countries here in the United States, and yet um, the uh, 15 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia and they weren't on the list, and Saudi Arabia is spreading extremism around the world, uh, it shows you how ridiculous the list is, and it shows you how prevalent the uh, and how deep the U.S.-Saudi ties are. Talk a bit more about Saudi Arabia and what you've learned about it over the years. You weren't a Saudi expert 10 years ago. No, but I wrote a book on Saudi Arabia recently called The Kingdom of the Unjust Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connections, and in doing the research for the book, I was astounded at what I discovered. I was astounded at how um, the cables have come out saying that it's not just Saudi individuals, it's the Saudi government that is funding extremist groups, including Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It's the Saudi government that is spreading Wahhabism around the world. Uh, it's the Saudi government um, that has become the number one weapons purchaser from the United States. So we are arming to the teeth the country that is most responsible for spreading extremism. And then meanwhile, we pretend to our own people that we're fighting terrorism. So it's all a big, scary lie. And when you come down to it, uh, it's important to educate people that I think in the whole Middle East, the elephant in the room is Saudi Arabia. So how much about the moment that we're in and the administration that's in Washington is new? And how much is a continuation? continuation? Well, it's a continuation in terms of the uh, ability to wage war that was granted to the executive branch by Congress by giving up their responsibility to declare war. It's uh, the architecture that's been put in place for drone warfare in the hands of uh, non-transparent bodies like the CIA uh, that was handed over to Donald Trump. Uh, the, uh, so a lot of these things have been in place and been used uh, under the Obama administration. But I think t Trump will take it further. For example, um, we are now not talking about the fact that uh, Donald Trump says that he wants to spend about $300 billion more money on the military. He wants every branch of military to be bigger. He wants more ships. He wants more planes. He wants more Marines. The saber rattling with Iran. Iran was the most important um, foreign policy policy achievement of the Obama administration, and it looks like Trump wants to unravel that, which is extremely dangerous, because Iran is a very, very uh, well-militarized country, a strong country, a big country, and going to war with Iran would be absolutely disastrous. So I am very worried about Donald Trump taking us even further uh, into a more militarized world, not only in the Middle East, but of course, uh, the way he's been talking about China and other parts of the world. So. Why are we in this state? I mean, you've been there since the beginning of the Bush administration, frankly. Um, we've seen the kind of waxing and waning of peace movements in this country. What do you think has been so problematic? Why has it been so difficult for us to build a strong anti-militarist movement that we could deploy it right now? I mean, at the Women's March on Washington, our wars abroad weren't even mentioned. No, they didn't even mention it in the platform. And we, we, we called them, we tried, we pushed. Uh, and we couldn't even get that in the platform of the Women's March. It's just extraordinary. I mean, one thing is to say that, that it shows how much militarism has uh, as such a stranglehold. I mean, you look at the unions, and so many union jobs are, are in the weapons manufacturing industry. Uh, you look at the, um, the uh, way that, particularly for people of color, the, the uh, military has been one of the few places where they've been allowed to uh, come in and rise up with in the ranks, mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult in many communities to uh, speak about ending wars because you're talking about jobs and people of color. But that's not why it wasn't in the platform at the Women's March. I, I think they, they said that it was controversial. And um, I do want to say that the first casualty of the Obama administration was the anti-war movement, and that we found that so many people who were opposed to Bush's war were opposed to them because this was Bush's war. And yes, things have gotten more complicated because we're not in one war like in 
invading Iraq. We're in seven different wars, and uh, and uh, of course, it's very scary to think about ISIS and the enemies. Um, but um, it's also because it was a Democrat. It was Barack Obama who was doing it. Uh, somebody just said to me, well, I guess we're going to have the anti-war movement back again. Uh, and it's because it is going to be Trump's war. And Trump's war, I think, will be opposed by a lot of people who consider themselves uh, Democrats. And maybe we will have an anti-war movement again. But it's terrible shame. Uh, and I take it as a, as a you know, personal failure, uh, not being able to educate people enough, not being able to build enough support for an anti-war movement that is not tied at the hip to the Democratic Party. We haven't mentioned one topic that I want to make sure that we just touch on, and that is Israel-Palestine and the Middle East. When we talk about the discomfort that a lot of people have, talking about our foreign policy, it's blended in with some still fear around talking about Israel-Palestine. But as far as I can see, things are shifting in the public debate around that issue. Has the message just not got through to Congress? Well, they're shifting in the public debate, and yet APAC still has, the, the, the lobby group APAC still has a very strong hold on members of Congress, and they fear coming out with positions that are against APAC. Now, that is changing somewhat, and APAC lost big time with things like the Iran nuclear deal uh, and the vote that happened in the UN uh, uh, around uh, settlements. But um, I think there is this conditioning that you better be careful about the Palestine issue that's told to every new congressperson, and, and when they're running for office as well. So you even see among people at the Progressive Caucus, and I don't know if I should name names, but um, uh, the, even some of the new wonderful congresspeople are progressive on everything but Palestine. All right, well, now I want you to give people advice. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but there are going to be more and more circumstances, I imagine, where people of conscience are going to be faced with the unacceptable and maybe think to themselves, oh, I wish I had an inner Medea Benjamin to get up right now, to say something right now. You've done it lots of times. We've seen you dragged away on those cameras. It is noticed. It is seen. It's a good thing to do, right? What do you tell people about how to do that when there's a lot of fear involved, I'm assuming? I think it's important for people to push themselves out of their comfort zones and to take the next step, whatever that next step would be. For a lot of people, just going out to march uh, is a next step. For a lot of people, uh, doing civil disobedience in mass, like was done in the climate group when a thousand people got arrested. It was a very simple arrest, but people were like, yeah, you know, I went to jail for justice. Um, so whatever level you're at, take it up a notch. And then when you're up at that level, take it up a notch because um, we have to be bolder, we have to be more courageous, we have to show uh, resistance in so many different forms to inspire other people in the United States and to inspire people globally. And to be honest, a lot of what I do, I do to show people outside the United States um, that we are not conforming to our government's militarism, our government's torture, our government's use of black sites, our uh, government's disregard for the lives of uh, people of color in our own country and outside our own country. So it's important to send those messages far and wide. How can people, if they want to connect with Code Pink, do that? Uh, they can go to our website, codepink.org, or our Facebook page. And also, we have an opportunity for people to join us in Washington, D.C. at the Code Pink Activist House. Uh, they can apply online for that as well. That was Medea Benjamin of Code Pink speaking at Progressive Congress this winter. You can get more information about Code Pink, her organization, at our website. In his speech to the joint session of Congress Tuesday night, Donald Trump announced a shift in immigration policy. Rejecting what he called a system of lower-skilled immigration, he called for a policy based on merit. His supporters immediately praised his newfound compassion, but the merits of discretionary so-called merit-based immigration, have always had more to do with politics than compassion. For one thing, U.S. immigration policy already favors those with wealth and skills. What Trump's saying out loud is simply what Democrats have long hush-hushed, namely that the U.S. immigration system is not only chaotic and open to abuse, but also massively discretionary, which is to say someone is sorting desirables from the less so. And it tends to work. 
not to help the economy or refugees or human rights, of course, but to solidify a new voting base for whichever party is in power. In the Kennedy-Johnson era, a shift away from merit to a policy that stressed family ties won Democrats the grateful support of a generation. Go back a couple of hundred years earlier, and immigration preferences were part of what American politicians used to split Irish immigrants from the cause of anti-slavery. At the time, Irish immigrants and African-American freemen tended to live together in the same poor neighborhoods, competing for the same menial jobs, linked by their experience of discrimination, colonization, and violence. Irish independence leader Daniel O'Connell was an abolitionist. He said, quote, May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if to save Ireland I forget the Negro one single hour. In 1842, alongside abolitionist Frederick Douglass, he addressed an abolition meeting that attracted 4,000 supporters, they say, including lots of Irish Americans in Boston. But slowly things changed. As the historian Noel Ignatev documents through force and the deployment of favors by influential politicians and bosses, Irish Americans as a group were gradually enticed to split from African Americans. Offered the chance, many jumped at the opportunity to become white. And Donald Trump seems to be hoping that the same strategy of sticks and carrots will work today. If his better-than-anticipated Latino and black male voting support or anything to go by, skeptics better be nervous. If the Irish could be made white, why not Latinos? It's certainly one heck of an organizing opportunity. Write to me. Tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. We'll be back next week with more.